Segway, to continue at once with the next musical selection or composition. Segway, to make a transition directly from one section or theme Segway, to another. Segway, to move smoothly and unhesitatingly from one state, situation, condition, or element to another. Segway, to perform in the manner of the preceding section. Segway, to make a transition from one thing to another smoothly and without interruption. This is Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the College of Arts and Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hello, everybody. A number of Chinese scholars are visiting Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, as part of the exchanges that we have with that country and our university. To learn more about the work they do in China and the interest of the, what they're doing here at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, we had invited three of them. They are Lu Shan from the computer uh, school at Shenzhen Aerospace University, who specializes in network security. The second is Q Dai, I'm pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, do yeah, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> who is an environmental chemist from Northwest Normal University and who specializes in atmospheric pollution and sludge. And the third one is Bo Liu from Northwest Normal University in China, who is a specialist in intercultural communication and linguistics. Welcome to all of you to Southern University and to our radio show, Segway. Thank you. Let me begin by asking all of you the same question, which is, why did you decide to come to this university at this point in time? Uh, first, it's, it's a very rare and a very good chance for, for me to, uh, how to say it, to improve my English, especially spoken English level. Because, you know, uh, many Chinese people have learned English for over, uh, just like me, 30, uh, 30 years old, <laughs> 30 years, but uh, I can't speak very well. So I think, yes, it's, uh, it's really a very good chance. And the second is I want to visit, and I want to know how uh, Western educational system works. Yeah. Is yes. this your first visit to the United States? Yes, okay. and it's my first uh, abroad experience. <laughs> yes. okay. How about you? Uh, really, I should send my thanks to my university, Northwest Normal University and uh, SIUE to give me the chance to study here. They have they are building a bridge for the scholars to study in the SIUE. And I, in the hand here, I could learn a lot. The teaching, the lecturing, the research skills, and how the communication between the teachers and students Yes, I've been enjoying the process. Okay, how about Bolu? Yeah, um, I'm here to attend this wonderful program. Uh, the reason why I at first uh, applied to this program is that I've been teaching English in China on and off about uh, eight years. But still, I found teaching English is very challenging as a foreign language to Chinese students. So I'm very uh, curious about the American classroom dynamics. And also, mm, I have some American colleagues working with me in uh, Northwest Nama University. They have very good skills and ways to encourage students to get involved in the classroom. So that's the, that's the reason why I'm here. Okay. Yeah. So share with us our your impressions about the educational system in this country. How, what do you think about the way we go about teaching our college students? Oh, I think uh, because I have uh, participated in three courses, uh, and uh, I think uh, there are not a very big difference in Western and Eastern education system. But I think just like uh, other things, Mm, there are really some very detailed differences. Mm -hmm. And uh, the differences and uh, such details maybe decide you are a winner, uh, you are winner or loser. <laughs> so I think, yes, 
I must uh, keep on watching and observing. And maybe at the end of the semester, I will give out a better answer. <laughs> My experience here about the differences, I would like to mention several points. First, about the uh, syllabus. The syllabus is a great part of the teaching here. The, the instructor or the professor will introduce the syllabus of whole semester to the students. So the students could know what the course is about and the, and the content of this, uh, the course and the arrangement of the every week. So they would know what we, every week I will do what. That's the first point. And the second is the atmosphere in the classroom. People could freely talk about anything about the subject, about, about the course content, and the professor or the doctor would give the, his opinion on this. And the, the interaction between the teachers and the students are great. Okay. Are both the same experiences that you have had? Yeah, I, I agree with what Steria just said, that the more open atmosphere in the classroom, the students can raise, just raise their hands and asking questions. And also the teachers and the students can have a discussion in the class. Uh, and also the students, mm, they have many group works. They have many presentations to do. I think that's the very good way to uh, to train their logical thinking and uh, work as a very good teamwork. I was wondering if when you go back to China, would you like to apply <coughs> some of the things you have learned here about teaching in the classroom? Mm -hmm. I think maybe I must uh, tell my Chinese students, you must uh, stop uh, playing with your mobile phone <laughs> on class. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I really astonished because yes, the Wi-Fi is so advanced and the, the signal is so good, but almost none <laughs> of American students play with their mobile phone. Okay. How about you? Yes, maybe I could uh, make some group work. You know, there are many students in one classroom for the Chinese. And we need to divide them into many groups. If you tell every group member to uh, speak out what they are thinking about the subject, it would be running out of time. So we could just uh, divide them into bigger groups, maybe three groups or five groups. And in every group, there will be one person uh, letting out his idea or the idea from the groups. And if possible, I would allow the students to uh, freely hands up on the, in the classroom. They could tell what's going on, and if there's any point they are not clear of, they could tell me directly. Since you teach English as a yeah. second language in China, yeah. I was wondering if you also would like to teach some of the culture of yeah. the American classroom. So if they happen to come here, they mm -hmm. will be more accustomed to what to expect. Yes, um, I will share with my students what I saw here and also mm, you know at the very beginning when I arrived here um, I'm a little bit frustrated because of the English I speak is different from people speak here uh, because uh, my English may be a little bit formal so when I come back to my school I may uh, teach students more conversational English help them to survive here, <laughs> <laughs> to have a life here, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, let's talk about a little bit about your different areas of specialization. And you talk about network security, and that is a big issue these days because of many reasons. Uh, people trying to break into companies to get their customers' data, governments spying each other, uh, people just hacking into other places. So my question to you is, do you think that we will ever reach a point in which we can really secure our networks so nobody can break in? <laughs> to tell you the secrets, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I imagine that was, that was going to be the answer. The, the only efficient way, I think, we have to change our password frequently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, otherwise, without any other ways. It's, it, it's true. How about encryption? Does it help that you encrypt your computer so nobody, even they have the password, they can really read what is, is in there using encryption? Uh, encryption, yes, but encryption, yes, it, it's always broken by um, much higher level hackers 
because the technology advances so quickly. Mm -hmm. We just it is just the uh, eternal competition between uh, white hackers and black hackers. Okay. <laughs> yes. So in other words, you have a ten meter wall. You build a ladder for a ten meter wall. But if you build a twenty meter wall, <laughs> someone yeah. will come up with a ladder that is twenty meters tall, so you can actually go over that. Yeah. Uh, I think if uh, if some people just like my father, my father always. Yes, he, he will have some password about his bank account, but <laughs> he will write down his password on her, uh, how do you say it? Ah, uh, but um, bank note. A bank note, uh, bank yes. Book, he yeah. just write down his bank note, uh, his password. So I think uh, almost uh, the cleverest <laughs> computer, um, computer, uh, Jenja experts yeah. will not save him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw a few days ago the introduction of the new iPhones by Apple. And one of the features they bring is that you can pay your bills and pay with electronic money kind of it's thing. It's more dangerous, I yeah. think so. You, you <laughs> using your iPhone. Yes. Is it, doesn't that create more problems and more possibilities to Must to be, break must the be. I have to say, uh, yes, I have to say must be. Yes, the, the condition will getting worse, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Especially someone always uh, lose their mo mobile phones, and uh, the, the, the condition will, will get worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk now about a little bit about the issues of pollution in, in China. Uh, uh, China has seen a tremendous industrial growth in the last 20 years or so. And of course, that means that there is more pollution because there are more cars and more industry. What is this, the situation of environmental pollution in China at the present po moment? Generally, the pollution is very serious, mm -hmm. but the good news is that we are raising the, aw the awareness of polluting the environment. You know, we have a, a five-year plan for uh, the government. The government will plan what they will do for the pollution control in the next five years or ten years. And for air pollution, for soil pollution, maybe there are specific problems. For example, for the air pollution, we are attaching importance uh, we are focusing on the particulate matter, we mean PM 2.5, and we focus on the concentration of PM 2.5 and uh, what is in it, and whether it is bad for our human health. And for the soil, maybe we are focusing on the organic matter and organic pollution or the heavy metal pollution. But uh, maybe the, the situation is worse but we are getting the awareness of a protecting it from any means we could make. Okay. Uh, has China gone the full transition from leaded gasoline to unleaded gasoline? Yes. Okay, so you don't have that problem anymore? Uh, maybe, you know, the lead in the gasoline is banned in our uh, country. And there are maybe there are lead, you know, beside the pavement, beside the road, mm -hmm. and it is accumulating every year. So maybe one day, even if it is banned, but maybe the soil maybe is rich in lead mm -hmm. and maybe bad for the, for the plants or the animals beside it. Now, uh, I've seen many videos of the issue of pollution in Beijing oh, yeah. and, and people wearing masks and all that sort of things. What type of actions is the government taking in order to protect the people's health against that kind of pollution? Yes. For the air pollution, the government is taking every means to stop it, such as control the cars, uh, to control the car exhaust, and to control the um, heavy industry, heavy industry around, uh, maybe around Beijing. And uh, other points I will mention is that the government is trying to um, maybe spray water spray water to make the vapor into the air so it could drain down, drain down the particles to make the air clean. Or sometimes it would have ban the firecrackers during the festivals. Okay. Some countries that have seen this huge increase in the number of cars have come up with measures such as depending upon the last number of the plate of your car, you cannot circulate in a particular date of the week. 
Has China developed that kind of restrictions in order to uh, reduce the number of cars that are out there at the same time? Oh, yes. Well, now in China, it remains to reduce the cars. Uh, and in Beijing, they would, you, if you want to have a car, you have to wait until you get their privilege. And it is really hard. The percentage is very lower. And for many, uh, many other cities, such as maybe Tianjin, mm -hmm. are also doing the same thing. And in our, in our city, my city, Lanzhou City, we don't, we don't have such uh, act. Uh, we are trying to do, reduce the pollution by uh, stop the cars by single, single number and a double number. For the last number, for the last number, yes, okay. yeah, doing such things. Okay, sounds good. How about industrial pollution? And I'm asking this question because unlike the United States or, or Europe, the government owns the big industry, the big heavy industry. Shouldn't that allow for the government to step in and create more regulations to control that kind of pollution or that doesn't work that way? Yes, for heavy industry, we have ever heard about environmental impact assessment. We have such regulation in China. If you want to put, put up a new industry, you should have your EIA, environmental impact assessment. If the assessment is passed, the industry will build up. But if not, it can't be put into practice. But in reality, it is that for the heavy industry, especially government, um, controlled by the government, it could go through. Maybe EIA, maybe just plays a little role here. And in our city, there's other means that may, for the government they will move the heavy industry out of the urban area to some area uh, around to make the pollution weaker. Okay. Well, now let's talk about English uh, being talking in China. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the vast majority of Chinese who are interested in le learning a, a foreign language, yeah. they study English? Yeah, yeah many, mm, I think that the population in China, the, po the English learning learners, uh, maybe the, the, the biggest, uh, we have the biggest number of English learners in China. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think our English education uh, do a very good job because uh, many of mm, the English learners, they are good at writing and reading, but they cannot speak. Um, they are not good at uh, uh, listening comprehension, mm -hmm. communicate with other people. Yes, I, I think that's the big problem in uh, English education in China. Another thing that probably many people don't know is that in China itself, people speak many different languages. Yeah. You have Mandarin, Cantonese, and, yeah. ma and many other ones. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if people who originally speak different languages mm -hmm. have an easier time mm -hmm. learning English than others. Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> 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 yes, they, mm, in China, uh, people in different uh, regions, they speak different uh, dialects. We call dialects, but uh, uh, the fact is that if we come from different regions, I may, I may, I may not understand what the other people are talking about at all. Um, I think many of my students, they speak dialects of their hometown. They would ask me that um, because I can now speak Mandarin, because Mandarin is a standard Chinese. I cannot speak Mandarin, so I cannot speak English very well. But I'll tell them that you are wrong, you are wrong, uh, because there are many perfect examples there. Some of my colleagues, uh, some of uh, English learners, they speak, they, they cannot speak Mandarin at all. They speak their dialects, but they can speak fluent and excellent English. Okay, so yeah. that, that, that isn't a problem. Yeah, I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, the other thing is obviously the type of characters used to write and read in Mandarin mm -hmm. are different from the Western characters. Yes. Is that a difficult transition for Chinese students to, to make from that type of ideograms mm -hmm. into letters? Um, I think, I think we're doing well. We're doing well because... Um, you know, though we have different uh, system, right? We have different system. But uh, for Chinese characters, uh, when when people are very young, they would learn the um, the 
kind of uh, yeah letters. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the letters for Chinese characters. It's uh, it can spelled, um, but it's different from English. So I think it's mm, it's not a problem mm -hmm. for Chinese learners. Yeah. What I do know is very difficult for Westerners to learn to read and write ch Chinese <laughs> yeah. because you have to memorize every single yeah. character. Yes, yeah. And in fact, there are many Westerners who can speak Mandarin but cannot read it or write it. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. It's it's very difficult for the Westerners because the completely different system and uh, uh, one of my um, one of my classmates here in in SIUE uh, he asked me that oh you have many stro uh, strokes uh, in in Chinese characters mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I read that you have to there is a certain order for uh, one Chinese character. And he asked me, is that true? You have a certain order? I said, oh, yes, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And, and the uh, other question, of course, mm -hmm. is how many of those characters do you have to learn to, for example, read a newspaper? Oh, I think maybe uh, thousands? Three thousand? Three thousand? Three thousand? Three thousand? At the least. At the least. At the yeah. least, yeah. yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you go into the university, you have to read more complex tests. You have to probably know 5,000 or more, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's just the same in English mm -hmm. because um, there are, according to us, there are many, many words, <laughs> a large <laughs> vocabulary in English, right? Yeah, but uh, I think, mm, yes, it's a very pain for Chinese students to learn English because you have to memorize all the words. Mm -hmm. But here, when you live a life here, you don't need those large vocabulary. You are very good at using small words, I think. But the same thing in China. We are good at using small words, the simple words. Mm. <laughs> the other thing about uh, Mandarin is you have words that have many meanings and depending